further ado, I want to jump into the Word. Take your Bibles with you. Don't open them yet. Put them in your lap. Just for a few minutes, I, I want to talk about some of the current events. Let's just narrow it down. I want to talk about a current event that's about to unfold. Over the next 24 hours, <laughs> I think our entire community, along with the state of Texas and the majority of the middle of America, is about to be overrun with population of onlookers. I don't know what they're coming to see. I haven't figured it out yet. I'm kidding. We're, we're, we're going to uh, partake of, as, as people, we're going to observe this, this uh, solar eclipse that's going to take place tomorrow afternoon. And, and I, because of that, with all of the stuff that's going on, there, there's been something on my heart that I wanted to share today concerning this. Um, I, I, Renee and I, we, you know, we like these kind of events. She really likes these kind of events, and I like her, so I'm going to be there with her. Amen. <laughs> Smart. And so uh, we're making full plans to do a couple of things. Um, if you're looking for us tomorrow, you're not going to find us unless you break onto our property because we don't plan on leaving the house. Amen. I, don't, I have no business being out and about with what we think is going to take place. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people. We're hearing of stories of people who had reservations for months and months and months that they showed up for their reservation just to be told they got canceled because of the, the number of people. So just if you can, find a way to keep yourself safe and out of the way until this thing comes and goes. Can I get an amen? So they, they tell us a few things about this solar eclipse. Um, we, we have our special glasses that we were told to, to acquire because if you look at this thing at certain times, it, it could cause blindness. I want to talk to you this morning about what this could blind. Because I think, I think there's some stuff going on and being said about this that can surely, it surely has caused a lot of blindness in the, in the eyes and the minds of well-intended people. I'm not here to pick on the people. I just feel it's my responsibility, and I'll show you in Scripture here in just a little bit. It's my responsibility to point to what is not healthy. And I don't think we're going to have this problem with our church because our church truly is mature in these areas, but we know people that may be connected to these ideas. They're out there. The, the, the speculation is running deep, thick, and wide all over about what this event means. And so I, before we jump into scripture, I'm just going to share a couple of things with you in praying that outside of the special glasses we need, I'm praying that we have the right protection that it will protect us from the wrong thing. Because to buy off into some of this, they make a compelling presentation. There, there's some very witty people that have looked and gotten very creative with what this event means. Let me say this. The Bible talks about there being signs from the heavens. And so uh, leading up to this, We've even been challenged by some that have pulled out scripture and thrown it in our direction with, see there, there's, there's these events that took place in the heavens that changed things. One was when the sun stood still in the book of Joshua. Another is in Joel chapter 2, which was also quoted in Acts chapter 2 about the sun and the moon being darkened and turned to blood. Uh, and then another is in Matthew where it talks about these events. Let me just say this. Those three specific events were one-time happenings that affected the whole world, okay? Two of them most definitely, one hasn't necessarily happened yet. So though, I'm going to tell you that I don't look to the stars for signs, especially the cycles of what we have in front of us. 
But there are a handful of things that when it happens, it's not going to be a cycle. It's going to be a one-time event. Like the star of David that the, the shepherds followed. That was one-time event. That was a sign from heaven. There's no doubt about it. We don't, we don't have to find creative ways to connect that to Scripture to do what they're doing with stuff like this today. When the sun stood still in the book of Joshua, in all reality, it wasn't the sun standing still. It was the earth stopping its rotation for just a, a moment, a, a several hours, so that that event could unfold. It, we don't have a practice of every year the sun stops. Come on now. That was a one-time thing that took place in order for him to uh, finish and accomplish what God had set him out to do. So anything we see in the book of Revelation or we see in Matthew, which talks about the, the sun being darkened out, we're not talking about a cycle in eclipses, the, the eclipse that we have in front of us. Those are, those are one-time events that are going to take place, and there will be no need to try to explain it. Everybody on earth is going to understand there's something big happening here. Can I get an Amen. Amen. And so we, we, we do our best to navigate through what I'm going to choose to call the silliness so that, so that we're protected from it and we don't buy off into it. Because some of it sounds like it may make a, a decent little argument. But again, here's some things that are being said about tomorrow. Um, are you all glad you came to church? Amen. I just want to make sure we get that out of the way. Everybody love me right now? If you find yourself listening to me and saying, ooh, I, I'm coming from that camp. I'm not throwing a brick at you today. I promise you. I did not know that you, you believe this. I'm just telling you. I'm praying for all of us that we put on the right glasses that would protect us from the wrong teaching. Can I get an amen? All right, here's some things that, that have been said, and, and, and I'm sure there's even more out there, but for lack of time to get into the scripture, I, I'm going to limit it to these. I've heard it said, this will be the beginning of the seven-year apocalypse preceding the return of Jesus Christ. So tomorrow marks the beginning of the end, in their opinion, okay? Um, number two, <laughs> this is the one that caught my attention months ago, and it took me about 30 seconds to realize there's no validity to this. It just sounds good, but it's, it's hijacked the minds of a lot of believers that are looking into this and buying into this and trying to find creative ways to connect scripture. <coughs> it is said that the path of this specific solar eclipse will pass over eight different cities between the United States of America and Canada. Eight different cities with the name Nineveh. Seven in the U.S. and one in Canada. Okay. Truth, there are eight different cities, uh, or at least some in municipality, that are named Nineveh between the United States and Canada. That, that is not a lie. That is a fact. Okay, the, the hurdle in this is two of the eight are in path. The others, aren't, they're not even going to be affected by this specific solar eclipse. They just happen to have the name Nineveh. Of course, they're using this to uh, ascribe that this is God demanding repentance, and this is judgment is following. Let, let me dispel something for you for just a moment. God always demands repentance. Come on now. God doesn't need a solar eclipse to tell us to repent. God, the, Jesus on the cross and what he's offering us with the words, believe and repent. He always demands repentance. Can I get an amen? Okay. I don't need some special event. This is a daily thing that we get to do. But let me say this. Of the two that are in the path, only one is going to be in the totality of this specific eclipse. So this is quite a stretch to paint an idea. Okay, number three. There's a, this, I'm not making these up. These are, these are things I have found. There's a city in New York called Rome. And because Rome was the persecutor of the church, this is in the path of totality because God is sending a message. Okay, here's my personal favorite. There's a city in Indiana that is in path of to totality of this specific eclipse. 
this isn't scary. It's called Rapture, Indiana. <sighs> come on. I mean, come on. You, you, can, you can just look at the state of Texas and travel the world just by visiting different towns in the state. You can go to Paris. You can go to Italy. You can go wherever you... Can, do, do we have to get this sloppy in creating what God is going to accomplish in eschatology or end times? Come on, church. Am I helping anybody yet? I haven't gotten to the really, really, really good one. All right. Here's clad iron proof that tomorrow is not just a cycle. This is an event. I just growled. I don't know why. Renee's been telling me, you growl when you preach. I'm, I'm going to stop growling. <laughs> See, you get to grow with me as a pastor and a preacher. There's a comet. The name of this comet was named after two men in the 1800s that discovered it. One in the early 1800s and one in the later 1800s. Discovered this and named it. So they named it the Pons Brooks Comet. Okay, this thing comes around in cycles. This is not the first time. It, and if the Lord tarries, it's not the last time we're going to see this cycle. On this comet, it has ice and other fixtures, gas and ice that do eruptions and, and, and explosions from time to time. And when it does, it sends these spikes up on this comet. So the nickname of this comet isn't just Pons Brooks. It's called the Devil's Comet. And it's going to be cycling tomorrow at the same time because it's named the Devil's Comet on top of the rapture, on top of the repentance, on top of Rome being judged, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Come on. It, it, we, we, by the way, this devil's comet will be back in the year 2095 if the Lord tarries. Okay, number six. Has, has anybody heard of these yet? How, how many have heard some of these or all of these so far? One side is astute. The other side needs to wake up. Or maybe the other side doesn't buy into this, and this side needs help. I don't know. Listen, this, this one's awesome here. The path of the solar eclipse that happened in the year 2017 that crossed this nation going the other way. Okay, the path of that solar eclipse, along with tomorrow's solar eclipse, which crosses this way, it's going to make an X. Okay, the, if you look at the two paths that cross over. So they've looked at this, and now they're saying that what that represents is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? And it's the word tov. And here's what they're saying this represents, that this, between the two, this is the last letter of the Hebrew al alphabet signifying the end, now, here's the truth. The word tov, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, does not resemble an X. It actually resembles a cross. And here's what it means. It doesn't mean the end. It's translated as meaning truth. Come on now, church. We're really going to, to some links, stretching and pulling to try to build what I believe the enemy's trying to do with the pursuit of eschatology to begin with. It's always going after inciting fear in the lives of anybody that will open themselves to it. Okay, who's, who's ready for more? You might need to get your calculators out on this one because they, they get an A for effort on this one because this is pretty creative. Silly, but creative. If you take 2017 and multiply it by 2024, you get the number of 4,082,408. If you take 4,082,408 and just get rid of the zeros, oh, and the last eight, you get the number 4824. And if you take 4824 and go to the Greek lexicon and look at the Greek number, it means calamity. It means destruction. No, it doesn't. I looked them up in both the Hebrew and the Greek, and here's what they mean. One means consultant or counsel, and the other means an inhabitant of some kind. It has nothing to do with calamity or destruction. 
What are they going to do with the zeros? By the they're really getting creative on us. They're, they're, they're really stretching this to try to promote an idea that we need to be full of fear. You need to fear the wrath of God. Amen. But the wrath of God is something that is at work among us in one way. I'm going to show you here in just a minute. And then there's the wrath of the Lamb that's going to happen in those days. This isn't it. If you think that the wrath of the Lamb is going to be summed up with this, I mean, we're selling this short. All right. Here's why I wanted to present this. To us, this is foolish. Because either you're connected to this church or you're connected to churches in the area and we've spent enough time pointing out the silliness. And so I think that we're pretty geared toward the truth. Can I get an amen? I wish I could say that's the story for the masses out there. there unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are being led astray in this. I read a, a post from a, a believer who lives in Brazil. They're not even going to be affected by this specific event, speaking of this solar eclipse. They, they won't see it. They'll, they'll see it on TV. But because this, this person is a believer, they wrote this, this little uh, uh, paragraph to share their story. And say, I'm going to read it to you word for word what, what they said. I recently read a story from a believer. This is me saying in Brazil. He said these past months have come with a lot of paranoia, anxiety, and great fear because most of the Christian networks in Brazil that promote the ministries of men and women all prophesying and preaching concerning the April 8th, 2024 solar eclipse and connecting it to end times scripture. The end is here. So out of fear and concern, I began to make plans and liquidate everything I own, write letters to loved ones, making preparations for the end of my life. I lost a great amount of sleep. And then God sent someone to show me the truth before it was too late. And when God showed him the truth, of course, he reversed his stance on this because he's exposed to the truth. Aaron, I would like for you to bring up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 really quick. I do not deny that we will see end times things perhaps in our lifetime. Here's the hurdle that I have with it. Here's the hurdle that I've had with it for quite a while. And I have not held my tongue on this. I've been pretty outspoken about a few things. It doesn't matter what I believe in the end times. It doesn't matter what you believe about the end times. There's too many ideas with too many scriptures and too many things that can be made up. I'm convinced of one thing, that if we focus on the Great Commission, come on now, whatever is going to happen is going to happen anyhow. And my faith is in Christ, so I, I'm, I, I'm either going to go through it, I'm going to go around it, I'm going to go above it, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be with him. Come on now. Amen. Amen. And so therefore, I, I'm, I stopped, and I don't even, anybody that wants to wage a, a debate with me or an argument, I've got too many other more important things to do with my time opposed to argue with somebody about something that neither one of us can prove anyhow. I'm clapping for myself because I'm the only one in here that obviously believes that. We're arguing about stuff that doesn't matter. We're fighting over stuff. And I had this revelation a long time ago. Eschatology or the study of end times is used by the enemy predominantly to create division and incite fear in the lives of people. Every time. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is an end time passage. It's in, its, in its entirety, it's eschatological in how it's written and delivered. Paul is speaking of that day. Some argue, say, that day was AD 70. Some say it's in the future. Here's the hurdle. Almost all of it is used to incite fear and trepidation in the lives of the believers. Look at verse 18. Go to verse 18. Here's my hurdle with it. He just got through talking about What's going to happen? And then he says this in verse 18. Comfort one another 
with these words. Of all, and listen, I, I've heard things from NASA, a bunch of non-believers speaking about this, not everybody at NASA, but people who are non-believers. I've heard a lot of modern-day popular quote-unquote prophets really digging into this thing. I haven't heard anybody speak about it with words of comfort. It's always some word of negative. Here's, here's one of the hurdles I have. We're supposed to be surrounded by a bunch of faith-filled, some are in the prosperity movement, some are in the faith movement, but we all talk about the goodness of God. Can I get an amen? And we all believe in the goodness of God. God is good, and we believe that up until the time that we talk about end times, and now it's all bad. It's all negative. It's all scary. As if, well, sin's gotten so bad that you better watch out. Newsflash, sin has always been bad. Amen. Newsflash, God is still on the throne, and he's going to have his way no matter what. Amen. We should be comforting one another. I haven't heard anybody speak about this eclipse with the idea of comforting one another. No, it's always preached in the negative. In the negative. Am I helping you guys? Am I speaking truth or what? Yeah. Amen. There's like three of us now. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 because the, it, it begs the question. Okay? We don't buy into that. We don't, we don't give our ear to a lot of the nonsense that's being preached today. We're not trying to drive, it, drive up people's fear. We're not trying to incite a panic. We can add this eclipse to the list of everything else that's going wrong in the world and all the diseases and pestilences and there's earthquakes and there's wars and rumors of wars and Israel's, uh, you know, just, uh, there's just a lot of reason that can be drummed up of why we ought to fear. So how, where do we stand? What should we do? I'm like, so glad you asked because I've been asking God, show me a scripture. Help, help me, not just to help myself know where to stand, but help me to point to some scripture that would encourage the body of Christ on where we should stand in moments like this. And it's amazing how much scripture God can reveal to us for those that ask and believe. Can I get an amen? Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 6. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. When you get there, give me a loud amen so I know that we're all on the same page. Where do we stand? Where do we start with everything that's going on? Some arguments make good arguments. Others are foolish. There could be some validity to some ideas, and there's some nonsense in a lot of them. But where do we stand, and where should we start? Can we just read the first part of verse 6 together? Come on. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not be deceived. The, the glasses that we need to put on through this thing aren't just physical glasses that can keep us from harming our eyes. The shades that we need to put on are shades that we can see the truth of the word as we filter it through the shades of the word of God. Let's let the word of God be true and everything else be the lie. Can I get an amen? Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Okay. Yeah, I've preached this in principle through different series. I've never stopped to, to consider exactly how deep this is. I don't believe that God gets mad and throws lightning bolts in your way because of sin. I don't. But I do believe that we have an active wrath of God that's on this earth right now. And I can prove it. It's called Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven like this. And then through the rest of that chapter, the Apostle Paul shows us for anybody that has been presented with the truth that God is the creator and they choose to worship the creation and not the creator, the judgment of God takes effect. Not, not in the future, right now. That judgment of God is this. 
If you're going to worship the creation and not the creator, having been proven fact after fact after fact and truth after truth, evidence after evidence that God is the originator, that God is the author, that God is the one, and you still reject that, God turns you over to a debased mindset. That's called judgment. Are y'all with me this morning? That you, you, you are turned over to a debased mind, and our world is full of those that are living in a debased situation. How can we make laws and decisions that are directing this nation if it weren't for a debased, I mean an apostate human being making these decisions? Nobody led by the Spirit of God is going to make these decisions and make it law. Mm -mm. Sorry. I, I think that we're, we see the evidence all around us that there are many that are living in an apostate mindset. They they are debased in their mind. Why? Because that wrath of God is still there. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> now let's look at verse 7. Go back to Ephesians chapter 7. Because I just read, said, let no one deceive you with empty words because, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This is where we, this is where we stand. How do we, how do we filter through the stuff? This is where we stand. This literally means when he says don't be partakers with them, this literally means don't be co-holders. This is worded this way because in the Greek, he's actually saying stop the act that's already in process. You know what I see when I, when I hear this? I see the mercy of God at work. God isn't just going to throw us under the bus because we've allowed things. He's given us opportunity to stop them. This is where repentance takes, takes work. This, is, this means to stop being a, a shareholder in this. Get away from them. Don't be partakers in this. Stop the act that's in process. Change your course. You've been allowing things up to this point. We have his grace and his mercy. Let's hear the caution. Let's hear the warning. You make the decision to stop these things in your life. Can I get an amen? This is important. This is that we have, you can't, you're not going to be able to blame your neighbor. You have to take responsibility for yourself. Uh, a cross-reference, verse 11 of this very same chapter, he says, and have no fellowship with them. In short, here's the words that I have. When he says here in verse 7, do not be partakers with them. With who? The sons of disobedience. Okay? Don't even be partakers with them. Stop the act in the process. I have words that are ringing through my mind as a child growing up with my parents, specifically my father, saying, choose your friends wisely. Yeah. Amen. Then he used to tell me, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I wish I could have grabbed a hold of that early on. I wish I understood that like I understand it now. Don't be partakers with it. I didn't, didn't say don't love them and pray for them. Don't partake in it with them. God called us to love the world. He did not call us to partake with the world. Can I get an amen? We're different for a reason. We're saved for a reason. We're supposed to look different, act different, walk different. We're supposed to be different. Can I get an amen? Oh, but that difference when you compare it to the world means strange and weird. Okay. I'm a weirdo for Jesus. I, I, come on now. I'm a Jesus freak. Do I have any freaks in the room with me today? Bunch of freaks in here. I'm a Jesus freak and I'm not ashamed. You can't say I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and yet look like the world because you're afraid to be judged. If you're not ashamed, then you're not ashamed. It makes me weird. It make, You're judgmental. <laughs> I'm a freak for Jesus. I can't help it. Amen. I'm not going to partake. Simply put, choose your friends wisely. Let's go back to verse 8. Am I helping anybody? Okay, I'm showing you've got to hear this. This is, where we, this is where we should stand. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now listen, Romans chapter 1, one more time, verse 7 says, to, who all, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Oh, I, I've got to convey this to you in the right manner. Here in Ephesians, he said, you were once darkness, but now you are light in 
the Lord. So walk as children of the light. When he says you are light in the Lord, in Romans chapter 1, in his opening prayer, he said to all who are in Rome, he gave you a title. He gave you a position. He gave you a standing. He called you beloved. He called you beloved. It's two words. It means be <laughs> loved. Ooh, that's deep. Beloved. You know, in the book of Acts chapter 15, when all the leaders of the church came together to settle perhaps the greatest issue that ever needed to be settled in the body of Christ, and it was how is a man saved? Is he saved by faith? Plus, and it was Peter and James and, and the others who heard what Paul and Barnabas were saying, and they came to a revelation in that room in Acts chapter 15 and said, well, you know what? We stand with Paul on, I'm paraphrasing, he said, we stand with Paul on this. We're, these Jews are not saved because they keep this law. He said, these, as a matter of fact, they're not saved like we think we're saved. We're saved like they're saved. Faith in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? And so at the end of this chapter 15, James continues to speak and James reaches back across the covenant and talks about David and said, through Christ, he's going to build the tabernacle of David. Well, guess what David's name was before God? Beloved. So, so literally, James is saying he's going to build the tabernacle of the beloved in Christ. That's you and I. I changed my stance a while back on a couple of things. I used to think that there's going to be this temple built over in Israel. And when that temple gets built, then all the signs of the end times are going to unfold. I don't believe like that anymore. I don't believe that temple, if they ever do put a building together, that, that, that is not the emphasis that God is going to work through. He's working through the body of Christ. We are the temple of the beloved. Come on. Come on. Well, what are we waiting for? We, we keep waiting for something to happen in the future, and God's saying, I'm going to establish my church through you because you're the church. You are the tabernacle of the beloved. Be loved. You know what I love about love? You know, I don't have time to go into all of them, but the Bible breaks down the word love four different ways. One of them is obviously the word agape. Quite a number of years ago, I had two buddies of mine. I was in a Mustang that really belonged to Renee, but I had souped it up for me and, and would take it out at night and street race and then bring it back to her in the, in the, in the day so she could drive it to work. And, and motor was hot, tires were bald. I mean, it just it was what, what it was. Well, one night, we were at the races. I had two buddies with me, and I'm just super tired. And we're, we're, I got confused. I'm on the freeway, and I'm thinking, okay, I need to make a turn. So I got off the freeway and thought I was going to turn around and get back on the freeway to go a different direction. And I went up the off-ramp <laughs> the wrong way. And I don't know how I didn't see it because there was, there was like these signs that said wrong way. Wrong way. Wrong way. And, and so the guys are screaming at me going, that's the wrong way. He goes, you need to find the one-way road here, Troy. You need one way. One way. One way. You know what agape love is? It's one way. Agape road is not a two-way street. Agape love is a one-way road. You are not beloved because you work toward it. You're beloved because you work out from it. You work out from being beloved. You don't work toward being beloved. You can't earn that. That was bestowed upon you because of what Christ did for you. Get over the idea that you're working to be the beloved. No, you used to be darkness, but now you are the light of Jesus Christ. You're beloved. Can I get an amen? Woo, come on now. I'm now preaching better than you're amening. All right, listen, I'm going to read verse 8 one more time. I, I, I'm not going to go terribly long, but you got to hear this. For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the world. So walk as children of the light. Verse 9. We just finished, uh, on our Wednesday night, we just finished Galatians chapter 5. It literally took us like seven or eight weeks to work through the material because the emphasis is the fruit of the Spirit. This is fascinating to me because I believe even though and there's translations that give different words the new King James and the King James use the word spirit because I believe the translators were thinking about Galatians chapter 5 but it says here you were once darkness verse 8 but now you are light in the world walk as children of the light verse 9 for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth 
There's another translation. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the manuscripts, that word spirit isn't in there. It doesn't change the context, but the word light, phos, P-H-O-S is used. And it literally means light because the Holy Spirit is light. Amen. What do you have inside of you? The reason I have such a hurdle with how we present all end time stuff is there's, there's no light involved with it. It's all darkness. It's all doom. It's all destruction. You know what? For anybody that has rejected Jesus Christ, that's their destination, and you're not going to be able to change that unless they have a revelation of Jesus Christ. For us, it's not doom and destruction. It's not horrible. As a matter of fact, John said that we get to boldly, on that day, we get to boldly look toward that. I have a confidence because he loved me. Love is perfected in us among this, that we have a boldness on that day. Why? Because as he lives there, so do we here. Why? I'm the beloved. Come on now, church. There's light in me. It's not darkness. Amen. This is really good. The fruit of the light or the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Here, listen to verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Look at verse 10. This is Ephesians 5.10. Aaron, bring up Ephesians 5.10. I'm so thankful for this scripture. I'm so thankful for what this scripture does for me. I can only use me as the example because I can't speak for you. I, or I'm a human being. You're a human being. Maybe we do a lot of things the same. But I'm a work in process. <laughs> I, I mean, really, seriously. There, I've told you several times that, you know, there are times when I, I believe God is like, hey, hey, Troy, come here. I got it. In my heart. Then there are times I feel like I've just messed things up just enough where it's not Troy, it's Hendrickson. Do I have any friends in the room? It's like, Hendrickson, come here. Let's, let, and then uh, you get into it, right? Why? I'm, I'm a work in process. There's, there's, I'm, I'm in process. And I'm figuring things out. Prove that in Scripture. In the Greek, when it says finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, this literally means learn what God wants. Hey, I love this. I love this because there was room for Troy's nonsense in the middle of this. God loves me. I'm his beloved, and he obviously gave me enough room to grow in this. Learn what God wants. The only way I know how to learn I can read a book, but I can learn a whole lot better when I experience it. Come on now. Trial and error on a few things. I, I, I've said for the longest time, as a pastor, I'm not afraid to try things because I would rather try and fail than fail to try. As long as it's not sin, right? I know some of you are like, ooh, he just said. No, I would rather try something if it doesn't work. At the end of the day, I would at least like to say, hey, we tried it and it didn't work. But it's through trial and error that we learn what we really can do. We, we learn God by learning God. Can I get an amen? I remember years ago I was in a pastor's conference. And when the, when, the, when the pastor, our pastor at that time, John Holler, he brought in his pastor. His name was Jim Hester. And it was in, we were in a room, probably 15 of us, kind of an intimate setting. And, and, and Pastor Jim Hester, we kind of looked at like our grandfather in the faith at that time. And so we all had the same mind. That what, Pastor Jim Hester, we've got him for an hour, hour and a half tops. We're not here to talk. We're here to learn. And, and he pulled out his Bible, and he just began to whip through the Bible. And he's talking, and he's tearing through the Bible. And so one pastor, he says, I, he goes, I, I, this is a rhetorical question. He says, but how do you, how do you know the word so well? And Pastor Jim Hester said, you know how I learned the word? And we're thinking, man, he's about to give us the secrets, right? There's, and we're going to get the in pass on this thing. We're going to be out. He said, you learn the word by learning the word. <laughs> That's what he said. And we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, you, 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 you work the word by working the word. Work the word. You want to know the word? Work the word. Work the word. Learn God. Learn God. He's not afraid of you stumbling here and there. Learn God. You're the beloved. Come on now. 
Learn God. Let's go to the next verse. Am I helping anybody? I promise you, I'm going to show that I haven't even gotten to the verse that I believe we focus on, but you can't take things out of context. So finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, verse 11, and I quoted this, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You got to hear that. Expose unfruitful works of darkness. What am I doing today? I'm not, I'm trying my best not to name pastors and ministers. I'm, I'm trying to expose the silliness. Just point to it. That's dangerous. That's not right. Stay away from it. He, verses 12 and 13, he says, For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Here's a verse that connects to several others in the, the, the Word of God, specifically the New Testament. This is a sobering verse. For those that think that you're doing things that nobody can see, you're cheating the system a little way, you've got this little thing going on in the side, you need to understand who you're messing with. Because he just said, for it's shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Have no fellowship with them. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Well, in context of the scripture, when he said the fruit of the spirit is these th three things. And I could tell you, I could show you in the manuscript that that word spirit is really translated light. But they're using the one and the same because the spirit is light. All deeds are exposed by light. Who's with you? The Spirit of God. There's nothing that you think you're doing that God isn't just totally 100% completely aware of. It's going to get exposed. He, he's gonna, the light is going to show what needs to be moved out. In the early 90s, I worked in aviation. And I worked next to a department called the NDI department. And we used to tear all these jet turbines down, wash them up. And before they could go for miking and, and processing, they had to be run through the NDI department. What this did was they put it down in this water that, that basically was a, a, a glow-in-the-dark water. They would pull it out and put it under a, a, a lamp that would literally expose every imperfection that's on that component. I don't mean imperfections to the naked eye. When you put this thing into a microscope, you can see hairline. I mean, they can't afford for a, an aircraft to, to go south, and the slightest little thing could destroy the whole aircraft. And so down to the smallest component, any kind of a hairline fracture, any hint, the only way you can see this is to put it into a special solution and put it under this bright light. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is in our life not just to make everything cool for us. The Holy Spirit's in our life to be the catalyst that will guide us and help us. And along the way, he's showing little imperfections. If we're learning God, we're learning God by him saying, now stop this, allow that, stop doing that, get away from this, abstain from that. Do I have any friends in the room? This is how we keep ourselves out of error. This is how we keep ourselves growing and moving forward is to literally... <clears throat> have no fellowship with unfruitful works, but expose them, for it's shameful to even speak of these things, because everything's going to be exposed by light. Verse 14, and therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. In the Greek, the words written here, when he says, see that you walk circumspectly, he's literally saying, be very careful how you choose to walk. Do we as Christians practice this? No. We've taken grace and run out there and abused grace. We need to approach this knowing that we're going to stumble from time to time, and we've got his grace, we're learning him. But we need to make the attempt to be very careful with how we walk. Yeah, the only way I know how to describe this is, there was a time when we had Ryan and Jordan as just little toddlers, just young, cute little things, before they got all big and mouthy on us. Amen. Now they're just young and cute. And we were shopping, and she went into, wanted to go into this antique store. And we stepped into this antique store, and it seemed like everything that was in there you could break by just looking at it. And I had these two bulls by the hands here. And I'm thinking, oh, we're going to get sued. We're going to jail. We, we'd have no business being in this store. 
So I had both their hands, and I'm telling both of them multiple times, you be very careful with how you walk. You be very, don't, you, you watch how you walk. Why? <laughs> Everything was delicate. I know we have his grace and his mercy, but this, the, the mindset behind this is you make every effort you can to watch how you walk. I believe that though we have his mercy and we have his grace, I believe we have a responsibility to live as holy as we possibly can before God. Can I get an amen? All of that that I said, here comes the, the scripture. Here comes the emphasis. Where do we stand? What do we do? He says, I'm going to read verse 15 to lead into 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Okay? How does wisdom function? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The, the, the word redeeming literally means making the most of your time. I'm not giving my ear in argument to a lot of the nonsense that's being perpetuated today. I don't have time for it. I, I'm trying to make the most of my time because there are just too many people that need to experience the love of Jesus Christ. They need to experience the relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're simply not scaring them out of hell. We live in a culture and a society that doesn't believe in the hell that you and I know is very real. How many of y'all want anybody in the last year to Jesus by scaring them out of hell? It's not working. I believe in a very real hell. Come on now. I believe in a very real judgment. I, I, I believe in the... In, uh, they don't. They don't. It's not their reality. They can be dead wrong and going to hell, but we're not going to change them by trying to scare them out of hell. They simply don't care. The, the only way that we're going to win them is for them to experience the love of Jesus Christ through us so they understand there is something better. Can I get an amen? We've got to make the most of our time. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Listen to this. This is a cross-reference to making the most of our time. Here's how we make the most of our time. Continue earnestly in prayer. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, said Paul. That I may make it manifest as, the, as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Redeeming the time. Make it, he, he literally just said, making the most of our time. We walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So my, it, what I just shared with you about what I think we need to do in today's culture, I just supported with Scripture that we redeem the time by walking as politely and as gently but we can still be seasoned with salt. There's nothing about this that says compromise who you are. Don't compromise who you are. Stay. You know, we're going to be looking at in the future on Wednesday nights, I'm going to show you that you, we've bought the lie that we're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to condemn. But there's a righteous judgment that we ought to be seeing in according to Matthew chapter 7. I heard it said the other day that back in the 60s and 70s, the predominant scripture for the culture John 3.16. Today, can anybody tell me what the predominant scripture for the culture is? Judge not. Judge not. That, tell me that we, we need to change our approach. Well, I'm not saying we've got to give them a pass. They need to know they're going to hell. They need to understand that their lifestyle is going to wreck them. They're not hearing us because we don't know how to approach them. We've got to change our approach. Amen. But we got to start in the house of God because judgment starts in the house of God. We need to learn how to properly, righteously judge. This is part of it. And judging doesn't mean condemning. And judging doesn't, isn't done in hate. It's actually done in love. You love somebody, you're going to help somebody. Listen back in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm almost done. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He just said, redeem the time. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. 
Understand what the will of the Lord is and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, which means an overabundance. It means too much. Instead, that should not be a scripture, by the way, that licenses practices like that. He, he's, he's literally showing us where we ought to be. He said, don't, don't give yourself to wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. For in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's where we should stand. Let me tell you what I think of when I think of the eclipse. Tomorrow, it's going to be a cool event. There's no doubt about it. It, I mean, it's going to be really cool. We're not going to get to see this in our nation for the next 20 years. Okay, so it's kind of cool that we're in the path of totality for just a few minutes. We're, we can experience something that we may not be around to experience the next time it comes around. It's going to be cool, no doubt about it. It's a cycle. Every 18 months, somewhere on earth, there's an eclipse. This isn't a one-time event. But let me tell you, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a believer, when I think of what's about to take place with this solar eclipse, the sun is supposed to be a source for us here on earth. Can I get an amen? And for a mere few moments, there's going to be an obstruction that gets between the source and us. Could you imagine what would happen to our world if the moon blacked out the sun forever? We'd die. We would, everything, nothing would grow. We would die. We need the sun. Yeah, this, this, in my opinion, could represent in symbolism and just remembering, don't let anything get between you and Jesus. Don't let anything eclipse what Christ is trying to do for us. Because there's a handful of things that will absolutely eclipse Jesus. The Bible tells us that the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. Love your traditions, but know they have their place. Don't let your tradition keep the word of God from growing you to the next level. Can I get an amen? And with that, I just want to encourage you to allow Jesus to be everything that he needs to be. Can I pray for you this afternoon? Have I helped anybody? My, my, my word of encouragement today, as the beloved redeem the time. Redeem the time. Because the days are evil. Make the most of our opportunity. Father, it's in Jesus' name that I thank you for this church. I thank you for every person here. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to grow us, to guide us, to provide for us, to help us, to encourage us. I pray, Father, that you could do something special, not just within us, Lord, but through us. And so I thank you for that. As we prepare to leave today, Father, especially over the next 24 to 48 hours, we have opportunity, to be honest. We have opportunity to, to share and spread the love of Jesus Christ. So I pray for a patience and a tolerance and an understanding. I pray, Father, for opportunity. I pray that you would put in each one of us words to speak. Help us to help others. Help us to be the light that you've called us to be. And I pray that when you bring us back Wednesday evening, that we come through these doors with a spirit of expectation. As we commit to keep Jesus at the top of all that we are. It's in your name and your service we pray. And the church said amen. I love each and every one of you. God bless you. Have an amazing day.